If you have your Bibles along, I would invite you to turn to Joshua chapter 4. Stick your finger in there. If you're losing, using the Pew Bible, it's page 183. In the red Bible in the pew, 183. Keep your finger there and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And that is page 956 of the, red, of the Pew Bible, 956. We have been doing a journey through the doctrines of our faith as a denomination. And today we're going to look at this idea of communion. It is so fitting that communion would fall on Memorial Day weekend. Because it is indeed a memorial for us to remember. And we'll see that as we read. I'd like to read 1 Corinthians 11 first. And I'm going to read verses 23 through 26. If you come to communion, these are verses that you hear almost every time we have communion. And I believe it's important that why we read this. Paul the Apostle is writing to the church at Corinth. And in chapter 11 at verse 23, he says, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed... The Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. This do in in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Okay, back to Joshua chapter 4. 1 through 9, Joshua chapter 4. When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose twelve men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take the twelve stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at a place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had chosen, one from each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, Go into the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it on your shoulder, twelve stones in all, one for each of the twelve tribes of Israel. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? Then you can tell them. They remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. So the men did as Joshua commanded them. They took the twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, one from each tribe, just as the Lord had told Joshua. They carried them to the place where they camped for the night and constructed the memorial there. Joshua also set up another pile of twelve stones in the middle of the Jordan at the place where the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant were standing. And they are there to this day. I think it's interesting. Um, We think about memorials and um, how we as, as people build memorials. We have things that we... That remind us of occasions, maybe special times in our life, or maybe even difficult times. Uh, who of us hasn't been driving down the highway and saw this kind of an um, area set aside where there's flowers, maybe a balloon, or there's a, a plaque there with somebody's name on it, and you know that there was where their loved one died. They want to remember that spot. They want to remember their loved one. They want others to remember that someone died here, someone significant. Um, we have those memorials. And I just saw some, some observations that I want to share with us this morning concerning Memorial Day. And one is, they were to be visible. When God told Joshua to go into the, the Jordan River, he they, they take these stones, he wanted them to build a visible reminder as a memorial. If our memorials are going to stand the test of time, they have to be something we can look at, we can, we can see, and we can remember them. Just as they did these thousands of years ago, uh, which the Bible says are there to this day. Now, I don't know that the, the pile of stones at Gilgal are still there, but perhaps some are in the Jordan. Those pile of stones could still be visible when it's uh, in the dry season. But, and we as a church have our memorials, Right? 
the cross, as I shared with the children, is something that we, when we see the cross, we're immediately reminded of something that happened 2,000 years ago, where the Lord himself died there. It's a memorial for us. We remember it. The Lord's Supper, as we gather and we share communion, we take of the bread and the cup, it's a reminder to us. Jesus said in 1 Corinthians, do this. As often as you eat and drink it in remembrance of me, it's a memorial for us to remind us of the sacrifice that God paid to the world or for the world. Uh, and I believe it's also important that they are visible uh, so that we, we, uh, we don't forget about what this represents. Without a visible reminder, I believe we can be quick to forget things. Uh, when Tina and I moved from, from Lidditz, we had lived there 29 years, saw our children grow up in that home, and uh, we, we realized it was time to get a different place, somewhere with Tina's mother would be a little more um, comfortable for her. And I really drug my feet, because I was thinking, you know, all of our memories are at this house. We saw our children grow up and learn to ride bike, and the things that we did, we have a couple of puppies buried in the backyard. I don't know if news people even know that they're there, but... Some of those memories I can still have, and I was, I was afraid we would lose those. Um, it was just so much. And, I, and you know the good thing about it? I still have those memories. I don't have to be at that house to have the memories. Those memories came with me. Um, but when we lived there, they probably had a greater um, impact because I could see. I could see, it was, for example, on the, on the boys' bedroom door where they hung a dartboard and decided to use a BB gun instead of darts to try to shoot into the dartboard. <laughs> we have all these small little holes in the wooden door. I couldn't figure it out, but it finally came to light. <laughs> but there's just a host of those things that with time you kind of forget about them because we've moved away. Uh, and so I believe it's important that we have visible reminders. How many of us have things in our homes that remind us and guests who come that this is a home where we worship the Lord Jesus we have signs in our home that our, our home was, was founded on love and faith in Christ. Those, those are visible reminders as memorials to us. Not that we want to forget, but it, it brings us back. Just as when we gather at a church on a Sunday morning to worship, we're called to, to just lay aside all of those things that, that are important, but can be a distraction because this moment, this time corporately, we want to honor the Lord. We want to remember who he is and what he has done and the promises he has made. I know we do at other times, but this is different when we gather together. It's so important for us to come together as a church. We need to be reminded. Um, and I believe it's important that we as a nation, that we as a church have visible reminders. Something else that I see as far as memorials are concerned, that the memorial has to have significance. There has to be some reason that we would want to do this. For the nation of Israel, they were to set up these stones to remind them of what God did in fulfilling his promise to them as a nation, of bringing them from bondage in Egypt to the promised land that he had, that he had promised to their forefathers. And he did it. And it's fascinating that he brought them through the Jordan River at the time of the flood, when the, when the river was over its banks. According to one commentary I read, it could have been as wide as a mile at the time they came through the Jordan River. That would just add even more marvel and, and miracle to what God had done for the nation of Israel. Some Maybe two, three million people would have walked through that riverbed. And it says in chapter 3 in verse 17, the whole nation crossed the Jordan on dry ground. See, in my mind, that's, how, does, how does that happen? This is a river flood at flood stage. And he parted the water. You would think at the very least they would be walking in silt and mud up to their knees, perhaps. But it says they walked through on dry ground. Is that too impossible for God? Of course it isn't. He could do that. And he did. He brought them through. Um, 
It had significance. And I think about that when, when the Lord told Joshua, get 12 stones from the middle of the river where the priests are standing with the ark. Go get 12. And they weren't just stones you could carry in your hand. He said, bring them out on your shoulder so that we can make a pile. You had stones that would fit in your hand. It wouldn't make much of a pile. I'd actually entertained the thought of bringing a wheelbarrow of stones here this morning so we could get the kids to build a a monument, but I was afraid of what might happen. (laughs) So I erred on the side of caution. Um, But that's what they were told to do. And and it was important that they didn't just get any stones that they could find along the riverbank. They were to get them from the middle of the Jordan River. That would have left an impression on them as a nation and certainly on their children and grandchildren that when they saw this pile of stones... Your father, your grandfather was there and got that rock, that boulder that he carried on his shoulder out of the river that God dried up. It says the water piled up and stacked up way back the river at a town called Adam, I believe. You wonder what the folks at Adam must have been thinking. All this water suddenly started swelling over more than it ever had before. But God, because he is God, is able to do that. And it, it brought great significance to them as a nation. Uh, they would tell their, their generations from thereafter of the power and, uh, and, the, and the promises of God that he kept them. Uh, you know, if I would have been in charge that day and I would have thought about building a monument, I would have probably wanted some, some grand thing with chiseled stone and maybe carved, you know, just to... God just took ordinary rocks from the middle of the river. He did, and the reason I believe that he did that is because he didn't want the people to worship the rock or the monument. It was to remind them that it was God who brought them out. That's all those stones were for. Those rocks were not to say, wow, look, look how beautiful this is. Isn't this amazing? Let's bow down and worship this. We are so prone to do that, even in our own world. We are quick to worship things and not the God behind the scenes working those things. I believe that was significant as well. For the church, the significance for us is the cross. It was there that the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus Christ. And I don't know. I don't understand how how deep and how ugly... And how horrible this wrath that God had poured out on his son must have been. Because he, the wrath was for the sins of the world, past, present, and future. Everyone who ever was to be born, who was born a sinner. And you and I all were, whether we'd like to admit it or not. We were born sinners. God took all of those sins, that rebellion against him, that wickedness, that iniquity, um, And poured it out on his son on the cross. That has significance for us as a church. It should. It should make us pause. And reflect about what that must have meant for the son of God. To take this wrath that God had against humanity. His creation. Because of their disobedience. And pour it out on his son. So ugly must have had looked to God that he had to turn away. The Bible says. He forsook his son on the cross because it was on the cross that Jesus paid for the sins of the world. To me, that is significant. I believe, too, the significance of the cross is a reminder to me that there, the cruelest and most brutal form of torture was inflicted upon an innocent man. It would be one thing if if it was a mass murderer and, and, we, and we gave him the death penalty and we carried out the verdict against him. But this was an innocent man. He knew no sin, the Bible says. He never did anything wrong. That's significant for us, church. To think that somebody who didn't deserve paid for my sins and yours. Significance of the cross of Jesus Christ is it was by the shedding of his blood that the new covenant was made. 
In Matthew chapter 26 and 27, we read this. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. You go to the book of Hebrews in chapter 9, it talks about Jesus taking the sacrifice of his blood into the holiest of holies, into the presence of God, to present that as an offering for the sins of the world. Beloved, that is significant. And I want to always remember that. The significance of the cross is when we gather around the Lord's table and we take those broken pieces of bread and we drink of that cup and we all remember that this was a real death where bones were broken and blood was shed. I was reading this morning about the crosses and um, the significance of the cross. Some believe that it was just a cross beam that Jesus was tied to and carried to Golgotha. Others believe it was the whole cross that he carried on his shoulder. And uh, some suggested because of the cross beam tied to his arms when he fell because he was so weak from, and fatigued that he, there was signs of a broken nose and jaw uh, on, the, on the shroud of Turin. I don't know if that's true or not, but we know that Isaiah says that he was beyond recognition because of what he went through on that Friday for us. Great significance. The third observation that I would share with you this morning is a memorial needs to be perpetuated. If we want to continue to keep this alive for every generation, we have to keep retelling the story, retelling the story. We do that with our children and our grandchildren about our faith in the living God. We have to keep that alive and pass it on as a runner in a race passes the baton to make sure they get it and they can run their leg of the race. Warren Wiersbe, in his commentary on the book of Jude, says the church is always one generation short of extinction. Well, that got my attention. The the church is always one generation short of extinction. extinction. If our generation fails to guard the truth and entrust it to our children, then that will be the end. Down through the centuries... Faithful men and women have passed on the faith of our fathers. We sing it. We sing it. The faith of our fathers. You and I, beloved, this generation has to be faithful to pass on our, our faith to the next ones. Because if Warren Wiersbe is right, we're that close to losing it. Is that perhaps why Jesus said when the Son of Man returns, will he indeed find faith on the earth? Will it have become so distorted and so compromised that it won't even look like the truth? Significance of passing it on. According to Joshua chapter 4, the fathers were to pass this on to their children. And I, I don't want to minimize the importance of mom and dad being involved in, in sharing their faith and getting their children to know Jesus Christ. I believe it's a team effort. But dads, as I look at the Bible, it seems to give the significance of passing that on to you and to me. Fathers, bring up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's you, dad, that have this responsibility. Dare I say the privilege of passing on our faith? It's important. I I, have no problem with mother and dad doing it together. I think it's even doubly um, important and uh, beneficial. But it seems to say when your sons come, you can tell your children, he says. Tell your sons. The fathers were to pass on the facts behind the memorial of those rocks in that pile. What in the world did they mean, Dad? What is that all about? Well, let me tell you, son. Let me tell you, daughter, what that really means. They had the privilege of telling them the truth behind it. The fathers were were to pass on the importance of the memorial. Son, the Lord kept his promise to our forefathers. He had promised to bring us into Canaan, a land flowing with milk and honey. And he did it. He kept his promise. Even though it seemed to take so long, God was faithful and he brought us in. 
and no obstacle could stop him. Even though the, the river Jordan was flooding, God said, not a problem. I'll dry that up and we'll go across. In the same way, I believe Christians are to pass on to their children the facts about the cross. It's not so much. It's not important what cross it was. It was important that Jesus died on the cross. It doesn't matter what it looked like. Was it the shape of a T or an X? We can argue about that all day. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, what's important was that God died on the cross. And our children need to understand that. We have to uh, emphasize the importance of the crucifixion to our children so they can, they can understand and they can make a decision to believe it and to accept Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And I believe we are to remind our children as Christians, whose idea was this that we, that we remember his broken body and his shed blood. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the Lord delivered to me, I deliver to you. Joshua says, the Lord said to Joshua, now go get 12 stones. It was the Lord's origination that we have this memorial. And we need to remember and to remind them. That's why we keep this thing. It's that important. We don't want to, uh, to ever neglect what Jesus has done for us. So what lessons can we learn and leave with this morning? Well, I believe in order for a memorial to last, to have any kind of longevity, to maintain its purity, it has to be visible. We have to be able to see, and we have to be able to comprehend, what does that mean? We, we want to be able to see. That's why we gather. That's why our churches have crosses on our steeples. It's to remind those around us, those passing by here, is where a group of folks meet who believe in what the cross did and that there was someone who died on the cross who provided atonement for the sins of the world. I like what the song says that's in one of our hymnals. It says, On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Oh, that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. In the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross that Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross, till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. I know it's kind of lost its importance, significance. It's kind of gone out of style to preach about the cross of Christ. But for you and I, as followers of Jesus, we look at that cross and there's something about it that just attracts us. That there was God who took my place and paid for my sins. It's a visible reminder. It has significance. It's the second thought I'd like to leave with you. It is through the cross of Christ that redemption is offered to the world. John 3.16 for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes should not perish but have everlasting life. What a, what a significant verse and truth it is for us to claim. And at last, the memorial has to be perpetuated. We must pass on the story of what is most precious to us as believers in Jesus. We have to be sure that the next generation gets the story and gets it accurately from us as a church. And then I just wrote one other thing at the bottom here. A memorial must not become an idol. I know it's nothing wrong with wearing a cross, having crosses in our homes or above our churches, but if that's, if that's all we think about is just the beauty of that and how it makes perhaps our clothing ensemble look the best or whatever we want to do. If it's just a cross of metal or wood, it means nothing. And we have to be careful. And I believe that's one of the reasons God said, go get those rocks out of the riverbed. And I don't want you to build a real fancy memorial 
because I don't want you worshiping the memorial. We are so prone to do that. You can read about that in the Old Testament, how quick the people of God began to worship things. Um, and he wanted to worship, and he still wants that today. But we, when we look at that memorial, we have to remember that it represents the truth, what it means behind that rem- memorial that we, that we uh, keep. I, I think it's right for us as a nation to remember those who gave their lives so that we can live free. Uh, I know we're, we're having problems. We've had problems as a nation in our past to the point where there was a civil war. Or there was the Revolutionary War of Independence. And, and wars are fought because there are those who say the values that we hold are worth fighting for so that we can keep these freedoms. And I'm grateful as one who who still can enjoy gathering like we do here. There are some nations where believers don't have the right that we do and we take for granted. So I believe it's the right thing to do as a nation to remember. And I hope that tomorrow sometime you will, you will pause and give thanks for the freedom that you have and for those who secure and continue to do that even today. Um, as important as that is, I believe it's even more important much more important that we remember the Son of God who gave his life on the cross so that we who believe in him can have eternal freedom. It's great to live in a free land, but this is only for a season. And we don't know how long these freedoms that we enjoy will still be ours to claim. Could be in the generations not too far ahead of us. We may not have this privilege. I don't know. But there is a privilege that we can have through faith in Jesus Christ that cannot be taken away from us. It's eternal freedom. John, the apostle, in his first letter, his first epistle, chapter 5, verse 13 says, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. A present possession that you and I can claim as children of the living God through faith in Jesus Christ. I I pray that you know that today, that you have that assurance as you leave. And if you don't, well, you couldn't be at a better place, my friend. Because this here today is holy ground. And Jesus' presence is here. We've heard that today. We've sung about it. We've welcomed him into our midst. He is here. And he extends to you forgiveness and eternal life. It's been paid on the cross. We don't, we don't have to add anything to that. He's paid the debt. He said it is finished. But he's, you, have, you and I have to receive it. He's not going to force it down our throats. You and I have to say yes to that, that gift. It is time to remember, beloved. Time to remember a lot of things. To remember our nation. To pray for our leaders. Our leaders need our prayers, beloved. They have stress like you and I probably have no idea. Uh, And there's always somebody bending their ear saying, my way, this is more important and this is the best. So pray for our leaders. We certainly need to lift them up to the throne of grace and pray for those who who are standing on the wall and saying, not on my watch. We need to pray more more than that for those who don't yet know Jesus Christ. Because if they close their eyes in death, and according to statistics, almost 7,000 people in America will die before before the end of the day. 7,000 every day. I wonder how many of those aren't prepared. And did I have anything that could have contributed to that? I don't know. I pray that's not true. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, uh, it's good to be reminded, Lord, to have memories and to have memorials. I read according to your word in Joshua chapter 4, you instructed Joshua to get these rocks from the middle of the Jordan River to make a pile as a memorial to the nation of Israel for future generations of just what you did for them. You kept your promise. And now these thousands of years later, Lord, there on a hill called Calvary, 
you yourself went to a cross for us. And most of us sitting here, I believe, have claimed that promise, that redemption, that forgiveness, the gift of eternal life, because we believe that Jesus is and was and always will be God, who came and took on human flesh and gave his life to pay for our sins. But Lord, I know that there are many who have not yet claimed that forgiveness, who have not received that gift. Help us not to forget that there is a world who needs to hear. And we need to be actively reminding and remembering what Jesus did as we look at the cross and as we take of that bread and the cup. May it serve as a memorial to us that we're to do it as long as we're here until he comes again. And he is coming again. Thank you, Jesus. In your precious name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand again.
Father, we are here today to declare and to give you thanks uh, that your wounds, Lord Jesus, have paid our ransom. Um, by your stripes, we are healed, the Bible says, because you love your creation so much. There was only one way for them to be brought back into relationship with you. And that is if someone who knew no sin would die in their stead. And there was only one who was able and was willing to come. His name is Jesus. And so we just lift up our voices and our hearts with thanksgiving, Jesus, that you died for us. And we believe with all our hearts. We believe those wounds have paid our ransom. And I just, Lord, I pray if there's one here in this auditorium that that right now would hear your voice calling them to believe. That you would give them faith to believe that Jesus paid it all. He paid it all. And that if they would but open their hearts and ask him to come in and to forgive them and to make them their, uh, his son or daughter, they would welcome him as Lord and Savior. He would come in. He will. He said he will. And he will forgive us declare us to be children of the living God, joint heirs with Jesus, and heaven is where we'll one day be. To you be all glory and praise. Lord, we ask you to go with us from this place as we go to our various activities and homes, and Lord, I pray that we would have time to contemplate as Americans what we have and what we're thankful for and should be as Christians, Lord, what we need to be thankful for and should be, and that we would give you praise with our lips and our hearts. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior alone, be glory majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever in all God's people said. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace.